Well, hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Debbie Douglas. For those of you that don't know, I'm the Curator of Science and Technology and the Director of Collections at the MIT Museum. And gathered with me on this lovely day in October 2021 uh, are the museum's four directors, uh, distinguished members of our advisory board, and my many hardworking and talented colleagues on the staff. Today's session is being videotaped for posterity, so we'd be grateful if you would silence your phones and um, uh, be relatively quiet, um, although we'll welcome all uh, bouquets and uh, cheers um, that uh, you might be inclined to share with our distinguished speakers. Today is the final program to be held in the MIT Museum facility at 265 Massachusetts Avenue. I want to begin with MIT's land use acknowledgement statement. MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation and we acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory. And we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. It is good for us to remember that our 50 year relationship on this site is only the most recent and that the history of this place is much older. So we have here four people. Some of you know them all. Some of you know one or two of them. Warren Siemens. Warren is the founding uh, director of the MIT Museum, but his tenure at MIT is, uh, predates that. He was in the Air Force even earlier. Um, the museum, of course, uh, his tenure with this, what we call the MIT Museum, began in 1971 and continued to his retirement in 1996. Uh, he was uh, passionate about history, arts, culture, and MIT, and he has entrepreneurial instincts that quickly apprehended something that MIT in 1971 had not fully known about itself, and that secretly, MIT loves history. In 1994, Warren had appointed Mary Lean uh, as associate director. It was a new post, I believe, at the time. Uh, the museum was growing, and it needed to focus its operations, finances, and staffing uh, to professionalize them. And over nearly three decades, Mary has built the operational infrastructure that has enabled the flourishing of every single person, program, exhibition, fundraising effort, expansion, and more that has been dreamed up since her arrival. But twice, Mary has also served as acting director between 1996 and 1998, uh, and then again between 2002 and 2005. And Jane Pickering was appointed in 1998 and served a four eventful and transformative years <laughs> in the history of this museum before departing for Yale's Peabody Museum. She subsequently returned to Cambridge in 2013 uh, as the inaugural director of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, and more recently in her new position uh, as the William and Muriel Seabury Howells director of Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. Uh, Alan Brody, once uh, who was Philip Corey's predecessor, the associate provost for the arts, once described, John, your arrival in 2005, uh, not so much as an appointment, but that rather you had been shot out of a cannon into the Institute's midst. <laughs> MIT has, had come to recognize and value the achievements of Warren, Jane, and Mary, all the more exceptional considering the limited finances, facility, and staffing that they had. But could it scale? That was the question and the challenge for John, who came to us as one of the world's leading scholars on the public engagement of science and from leadership positions at prestigious posts throughout the UK. The question was, could he increase the visibility and impact of the museum by two or three orders of magnitude? But Warren, I wanted to ask about 
begin by asking about the museum's early years. And I want to pause for a moment and set the stage for um, all of us here tonight uh, and bring you back to 1971 when gas was 36 cents a gallon, when Walt Disney World in Florida had opened for the first time, when NASA was launching its final Apollo missions, when the ARPANET debuted, when Ali fought Frazier, when the Temptations sang Just My Imagination. <laughs> Cigarette advertising on TV had just been banned. The voting age was lowered to 18. And Americans were painfully divided over virtually every issue of consequence from race and gender, gay rights, the environment, housing, education, jobs, and most of all, the conflict in Southeast Asia. So given all that upheaval and discord of that moment 50 years ago, uh, when plans were being made for the October 7th, 1971 inauguration of Jerome Wiesner, uh, the theme of that inauguration of a 10-day event was called introspection. Wiesner sensed that the moment that called for reflection was a, that this moment was called, called for reflection and rededication of the community to the values and ideas we all share. There was a 10-day celebration. They'd never done anything like this before that featured concerts and colloquia and parties and exhibitions. But today, I want to call attention to one particular exhibition. It's called Retrospect, MIT 19, or excuse me, 1861 to 1916. Now, the tech reports that the exhibit was organized by Professor Richard Douglas, the uh, head of the Department of Humanities. So Warren, I want to have you start off this conversation by saying, how did you get involved, and how did this small exhibit of photographs and drawings from MIT's first 55 years of history turn into an accredited museum? Very simply, I, uh, I, <laughs> I was um, in the Department of Humanities as the administrative officer. And the head of the department, Richard M. Douglas, uh, sent me a note, which is probably here in the file, asking me to find a few photographs to put up for an exhibit for Jerry Wiesner's inauguration. So that sounds simple. I'll just go to archives and pick up, a choose a few photographs and put them up. Well, I went to the photographs and was very quickly informed that they didn't collect photographs, that they only collected the official records of the Institute, and photographs were not part of that. So I started searching, and we started finding things everywhere we turned around. I need to say, sort of at the beginning, that my previous job at MIT prior to the Department of Humanities was in the personnel or human resources, as we now call it. And in that position, I was in charge of, of finding, hiring, uh, promoting, whatever you do, to the hourly People, and there are a lot of hourly people at MIT. So I got to know not only a lot of the hourly people, but their supervisors as well. And they, uh, they for example, one of the, our major finds in getting going was I called on my friend Elmer Condon, who was head of the movers, and I asked him if he knew where he knew where everything was. Everybody just gave Elmer the stuff they wanted to get rid of, and he would find a place, usually in, in this building, by the way. And uh, the first thing he led me to was a, the, uh, a room up on four, fifth, fourth floor, I guess it is, that had not only William Barton Rogers' portrait, the original one that no one had seen for a long, long time, but about 20 other important portraits and busts, and uh, I immediately took the uh, portrait of William Barton Rogers down to Howard Johnson, and he immediately told James Ryan Killian, the saint of all saints as far as I'm concerned, and uh, Killian asked to come up and me to bring him up here to see it. And he said, don't let any of this go. We've got to save the history of the place. So that's the, basically the beginning. So we started gathering 
and physically searching for whatever we could find, and we filled an entire building with it, I guess. So, so the museum, I mean, excuse me, that exhibit went up in October, but presumably it came down. It was in the corridor in uh, Building 14. Uh, what happened next? We started what became historical collections. And uh, that, w with that, I, re started, I reported directly to Howard Johnson for the first two or three years. I was the only person at the Institute who reported directly to him. And uh, that, that led to uh, a, a true search going through every storeroom in, in the, at the Institute. And this, in turn, led to a lot of interest in, with the alumni. Uh, we had all sorts of things that the alumni were more interested in. Uh, most MIT alumni would rather talk about their history than they would about the latest scientific ad advance. And uh, that's true. So we, we started drawing a lot of interest from uh, alumni. And in our fifth year, which would be fifth year of existence, probably 76, um, I invited the members of the class uh, at the reunion to come up and see us we were still back in, in uh, a small part of the, the other part of the building. And as part of that, uh, they were so impressed that uh, by what they had seen, we, although we didn't really have official exhibits, that they both, both the class of 25 and 35, uh, made, uh, suggested the MIT collections, historic collections, be given part of their class gift. Well, this is a no-no. <laughs> <laughs> and that's got us the interest of, of uh, the higher-ups. And we just had to fight from there. I think John and Jane particularly, uh, and Mary, of course, is the mastermind of keeping track of all this, it would come as a bit of a shock that Warren was forbidden from raising money. <laughs> I thought it was compulsory. <laughs> on, on that front. Warren, in the uh, early years, you had a really intense service mentality of doing exhibits for anyone and everyone who asked, um, from the corridors at MIT to uh, I read in the president's report that you even took uh, very early on a trip to the Florida to the Kennedy Space Center and uh, represented um, MIT and and what you know and the historical collections to a couple hundred thousand people who visited. Um, tell us a little bit about how you cultivated that service ethos and and some of the early team members who worked with you. Uh, as far as the audience, well. Uh, if I get the question correctly. Uh, I started uh, at the request of the Alumni Association to go to tour uh, MIT clubs around the country. And I think I hit every club in Florida at least three times, and there's a lot of clubs in Florida. <laughs> I hit uh, everywhere from St. Paul, Minneapolis, St. Paul, to uh, Montana, to <laughs> Uh, actually, some in New England. So uh, word spread through that that group that we existed, and that helped uh, as well. So I was invited to do a lot of things that uh, helped spread the word. And uh, I should indicate that there was a tremendous. I by this time, uh, well, I should say at the beginning that we had no budget, none whatsoever. And uh, our main workforce was Northeastern work study students. And we owe Northeastern a tremendous amount because we didn't pay them anything. And we continued to have work study students through it, even after we could finally start to hire MIT students. But then we were able to hire uh, some staff, such as Barbara Linden, who was, came from uh, the archives was a mainstay. We had uh, Michael uh, Yates, 
who had been a work study student who became a regular staff member. We had we built up a very, very good and talented staff of people who were really dedicated and could see a future in in what we were doing. So, so one of your pivotal acquisitions came in '93 when you bought the holography collection, and that's about the from the uh, Museum of Holography, and that's about the time Mary, you, and Jane came on board. And I wondered if we might ask you some questions about the mid 1990s. Mary, maybe you can reflect on those, you know, first years. And really, here's the burning question: Is it true that MIT wanted to get rid of the museum, or thought about getting rid of the museum in the mid 90s? Well, I remember Joel Moses, who was the provost, did challenge us about what is the purpose of the museum and does it serve MIT students? Um, so we, we had to document that. I mean, we, we did then, we do now. Um, we're a resource for students and faculty and classes in providing materials, original materials for their work. Um, and I think we also made the case for how the museum serves the public. But yes, Debbie, we were challenged by the provost. <laughs> so Jane, you come in. Tell us, what were your first impressions of this place? I mean, you come from uh, England. England. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, There's a bit of a conspiracy here. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> so yeah, I, I was thinking about that because that was a question that was asked when I was interviewed, like, why should MIT have a museum? And I remember thinking that in some ways, I mean, you always get that question in a university museum, right? You're always being asked about service to the university, you know, like versus service to the wider community. And hopefully the two actually are the same thing. Um, but I remember thinking that the MIT museum was almost like the purest form of a university museum, because it really was a museum of MIT. And, and so many, I mean, where I'm working now, we're sort of a museum of the university, but not really because we have a sort of real disciplinary focus, right? We're, I'm in an archaeology museum right now. Uh, and whereas MIT felt like the museum could be MIT's museum, and I came in and it felt sort of multidisciplinary before that was sort of fashionable. Now everyone does that, but it sort of was before that, that, you know, we had the historical collections, the holography collections, and I remember, I'm sure people here, I remember Don Stidson, um, dear um, person that we miss, and Don taking me round the galleries and seeing these holograms, and he was, you know, you know how everyone thinks they know what a hologram is, and they really don't. They think it's something on a ruler, you know? Um, and him very patiently explaining to me what actually a hologram was. And so then I'm in the holograms, and then suddenly I'm in this exhibit gallery with Arthur Ganson's amazing sculptures. And it just, it almost felt liberating that like, wow, this is a museum that could really be so many things, and so many things all at the same time but also a sense of, okay, we do sort of need some sort of focused mission that thinks about MIT, and particularly the sort of art science issue, you know, just things that, that the MIT Museum could be really, really good at. Um, and so, yeah, I think there was definitely that sort of, but that's, that's often a pressure, but yeah, there was definitely a feeling of that, I think. Um, so. John, we you know, know that you had a wife here in Cambridge, but you were a thriving professional in the UK, and what is it that kind of sucked you over here beyond uh, the desire to maintain good family relations? Yeah, I was actually spending too much on air miles or whatever it is <laughs> in the period before I came here, so there was that. But I think the, it's, it's rather similar, I think, to what uh, Jane's just been saying. There's something about the potential. I still think today, actually, the potential of the place is far greater than the actual. And that's exciting. That's something to go for. You know, I mean, it's not very inspiring to be in a place where you think, well, it's pretty much done everything it can. And um, it's just a matter of cruising. Who wants to be in such a place? I don't know, but not me. So uh, I, I was very attracted to that. Um, it is a feature of museums in general, I think. 
that they are, in a certain sense, ambiguous as to what their true character is. If, I mean, I'll make an analogy with academic departments. If you ask, well, what exactly is the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics? I mean, you don't need to ask, because it's kind of obvious, right? But if you ask, what exactly is uh, the Gardner Museum? Or what exactly is the MIT Museum? It seems as if the question needs to be answered. And it's not, I'm not original in pointing out that it's a great advantage of museums that they have this ambiguity because they can be molded and shaped and they can do all sorts of things. And, and I, I think exploring the envelope of what you could do right. and what might be interesting and what might be productive is part of what makes it a joy to work in a place like this. It feels very MIT. I mean, yes. I've, had, I've worked in many different universities, so. It feels, you know, sometimes I'm in a situation where I think, ah, oh, yeah, I remember that happened at Yale, you know? And you're, you're trying not to sound all super, like, oh, I worked in all these great universities. But, but MIT is different. I mean, I can safely say that having worked in several <laughs> <laughs> universities at this okay. point. But it felt like a place where you could do all that. Yes. And, and actually, it was encouraged and, yes. and was sort of typical of the rest of what? the community. One thing I will just comment on, I'm interested to know if this was true also for every, all of my other colleagues on the tape, on the bench here or wherever we're on, um, the panel. I mean, MIT likes to know what's going on and there is a whole administrative structure. No one has ever questioned me about why we're exhibiting this or why we chose that topic. Why are you doing this thing called the enemy, which you know is, was all about international conflict um, or intranational conflict, actually, as well. And there was a great liberty, and there is a great liberty to explore, to experiment. Was that always true? I mean, Warren, was that true for you? Did you feel under pressure to exhibit certain things, or were people happy for you to do more or less whatever you and your colleagues decided. Uh, if I understand, we just, we could do anything we wanted as far as yeah. exhibits because we, we had no guideline. Right. We had wonderful collections and there were building collections. So uh, we took, after we developed exhibit space on, in here, we also took over Compton Gallery. Yes. In the main campus, so we had a really good exhibit space there, and then we took over the Hart Nautical collections and gallery, and so we just, we just had a, as wide a variety as possible from uh, Charles Woodbury, who was an American artist who, an early American Impressionist, which has happened, the Institute has, he graduated in 1888, I believe, and uh, so we could, do whatever we wanted to. No one, no one told us anything. Right. And we did have an advisory committee, which was very supportive in yep. those early days. and yep. helped us open doors and find materials and so forth, so. Fantastic. Warren, uh, you raised a question. You shared Woodbury, I know, is one of your loves. But I'm curious with the others if you have particular objects or collections or programs or projects that you've had a particular passion for. Uh, during your tenure here? Well, I'll share. I'm, I'm very interested in architecture and design, so I love the architecture and design collection, which comes out of the Beaux-Arts tradition. Um, we have incredible drawings and um, plans, and we had the opportunity when the architectural um, collaborative firm was um, disbanding to acquire some of their archive. And I'm afraid that I was helping with the dumpster diving and rescuing <laughs> some of those plans. Um, but they, as it turns out, they are now one of, if I'm not mistaken, one of the most requested collections because there are many buildings designed by the firm TAC, um, as it's known, that are being restored or are being worked on. And so, you know, the that documentary evidence um, is really important. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one of my favorite collections. So that's totally brilliant, Mary, um, because I sort of liked all the others. <laughs> Not that I have anything against architecture, um, but <laughs> I sort of was like, oh, wow, the history, 
you know, the hacks, the holograms, there's a lot of H's in that. Um, you know, and then the heart. Oh my God, that's four H's. Yes. Okay, the heart nautical collection. So for me, it was just so, so exciting to see all these different things, yeah. many of which I knew zero about. I remember coming in and saying to people, I'm like, she says modestly, the best director to have, because I know absolutely nothing about any of these things, so I could let you get on all these amazing curatorial and collection stuff. You guys can get on and, and tell me what you need, and let's think of a vision, and let's, you know, but I, I'm not, I don't know one end of a yacht from another, you know, I, I learned quite a lot about the history of science and MIT culture, you know, pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so so I, it's hard for me to okay. pick. For each of us, it's yeah, different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, it's not that I want to say I don't like architecture, Gary. Yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> say that. But, but since Mary said that, I thought I could say I have a different sort of answer because I love, love lots of the stuff. But the thing I really remember being so pleased about when I first came was that this museum actively collects. Uh, because I had a previous experience in a very large, prestigious museum, which I will not name, <laughs> since I'm now going to criticize it, yeah. which had such a large collection and such a sense of self-importance that it had largely stopped collecting. And I struggled there to try and persuade people that you know, science and technology, which was what this place did, hadn't stopped. <laughs> they ought to be collecting modern stuff. And when I came here, as I think we probably all have done, I'm guessing with Warren, I'm afraid, but there was a collections committee and I duly attended. And every single meeting, there are new acquisitions. And Gary and Debbie and the rest of the curators are coming forward and saying, look at this thing. And we, ha we just collect. Sometimes we collect things and you think, oh, well, I suppose so. But more, <laughs> more often, it's like, wow. You know, I remember the day, it was uh, probably more than 10 years ago now, Debbie will know, when we had the opportunity to collect a whole series of 1950s and 60s toys, children's toys, that were made by Claude Shannon, one of the founders of information science and technology. And he made these things to amuse his kids, because he thought it was boring, I think, to go buy a, to a, store, a store toy when you could design something better. And they were better. I mean, they're amazing. Juggling machines and uh, the, one of the world's first chess playing machines. We have these things in the collection. It's amazing. Um, and some of them will even go into the new museum. You know, that's the thrill for me of being here that the collections keep doing this, which we have to have a talk with Associate Provost Philip Curry and the Provost occasionally about because <laughs> it means that, you know, we keep running out of space. But that's yes. another story. Well, and the great thing about the Collections Committee, and I'm sure this was Warren's doing, was having Claude Brenner as the chair of that while I was there. Yes. And he was someone that I dearly loved and was so kind to me, especially at the beginning when I was like, yeah. Ah, I don't know anything about MIT. And he sort of would talk with me, and he had so many stories. And he and I'm assuming that you knew him well, Warren. And yeah, that was he was a yeah, yeah great person. And he ran the collections yeah. committee really, really well. Yes. You know. <laughs> I um, am curious. You've shared about your love of collections, but I have a lot of exhibitions and programs colleagues here. I'm wondering <laughs> yes. uh, if you might give some. Uh, share some of your um, most um, enjoyable innovations. I'm thinking of FAD and FAST and Soapbox, and of course, we can't, the Science Festival. And I, I'm just wondering if uh, you might share some stories about some of your uh, favorite or memorable or challenging programs um, and or exhibitions that uh, you undertook during your tenure here? Well, it, it, to me, it's amazing how, uh, how quickly the, the, we got support. But I wanted to point out one example. Uh, the Al Hill was a, a vice president of, of research, I think. And he asked us, we were coming to the, he had been come to, to MIT as part of the Rad Lab. And he wanted to do something to celebrate while there are still a lot of people around to celebrate the, the 
history of the Rad Lab. So he asked us if we would go down to uh, outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to choose a few photographs from the collection, which had been taken directly from MIT and put into federal st storage there. So we get down there and uh, found very quickly that it was a huge collection, that it was also due to be just destroyed. It was in, in the channel to be destroyed within the next six months. So I called Al Hill and he called right back and said, rid a truck and bring the whole thing back. So we got the whole history of photographic history of the Rad Lab it, it just in one fell swoop. And it, that, to me, is an exceedingly important part of MIT story, the Rad Lab and how it transferred, transformed MIT into a uh, top flight, not that it wasn't top flight before, but a top flight research university as well as uh, other things. But I could go through so many of the collections that came in in the same way, it came in as a bulk, like the hologram collection, for example. We, bought, we were sent to an auction to pick up a few pieces that Steve wanted to have here at MIT, and we ended up getting the entire collection of holograms uh, because they wanted to hold the collection how many, how many together. How holograms was that, or? Yeah. How many holograms was that? Oh, I don't know. We had More than 2,000. More yeah. than 2,000, yeah. yeah. Largest collection in the world. Right. It's right. by far the... <laughs> Best just like cool. that. We just happened to get the whole thing, you know. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, oh Warren mentioned, though, reunions. And I have to say that the reunion event around, like the Rad Lab, the Whirlwind Computer people, we did it with lasers, we've done it at Lincoln Laboratory, a number of occasions. Um, the museum has hosted really significant events with pioneers in computing and radar and, and the like. And I'd have to say, Warren, you really innovated the reunion event, you know, which often had an accompanying exhibition, a program, um, gatherings with people as one of the first most successful types of programs this museum had. And but an opportunity for collecting oral histories, trees. which, you know, are so important for documenting whatever the activity is. But I know, Jane, you and John really also began to push outward and bring some new kinds of programs for families and other audiences. And I wonder if you might tell yeah, some stories so, about those. So I, I was thinking about that because you had mentioned that last week. And, and of course, the Friday after Thanksgiving science was brilliant, I have to say. Nothing to do with me, but just really, really great staff that come up with an idea and you're like, that's the idea. Um, and now I can't remember what FAST stands for other than Science and Family, Technology. Family Adventures in and Science, science and, and Technology. technology. Yeah. Yes, and I remember we started that, <laughs> and that was really great, but you know, thanks to Arthur. And then the other thing I really enjoyed, and I remember because it was just as you were starting, Debbie, um, was the exhibition on artificial intelligence. Oh. It was called, was it called Robots and Beyond, Beyond then? Yes. Yeah, Robots yeah, I think so. So anyway, we did that because um, I remember we were slightly short-staffed, um, as <laughs> often was the case. Uh, and so I ended up, and this was pre-Debbie, um, I ended up doing a lot about the history of AI, which I knew nothing about, <laughs> but working with Rob Brooks and other members of his lab and everything, which was really fun. Yeah. Um, and then spending ages getting this um, actually non-MIT electronic robot from Bristol, England, which was on loan to the Smithsonian. Oh, no, no, it was at the Smithsonian, and we got this loan, um, and Rob Brooks just being he said to me, there's this thing, and I've always wanted to have it. And Is it I, the turtle? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes okay. the turtle. Yeah, yeah. So managing and being so impressed by the power of the internet, because I was able to track this down. And at the time, you know, it wasn't quite like today. But anyway, so, so I loved that, doing that exhibit. Um, and it felt like, because the other exhibits had sort of come in under your tenure and Mary's with the holograms and Arthur Ganson sculptures, but that was something that, that we did that was sort of, yeah. sort of new. 
Um, and then fat and fast, of course, felt. And I, very just special. as a credit to what you're saying, Jane, I mean, we didn't finally manage to stop. Um, the Friday after Thanksgiving chain reaction until just a couple of years ago. I mean, we, the reason was that Arthur Ganson, whose yep. idea it probably had been? It was him and one of our staff. Marsh, was Marsha, it Kathy Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Marsha. And Kathy yeah, so Thurston Lady. Marsha and Kathy and yeah. Arthur right. sort of collectively came well, up with that. By the time yeah. I got here, Arthur was the impresario who was yes. overseeing this extraordinary chain reaction. And he also made the final link in the chain. So he was kind of essential. And each year we'd say, well, would you mind doing it next year? Oh, all right, then, you know, and then I'd, I might make next year my last year. And then you get to, well, perhaps one more. <laughs> and this went on and on and on, you know. And um, it went on because it was, it, you're absolutely right. It was just right for the MIT Museum. And we would have, in the latter stages of the program, we'd have you know, the best part of a thousand people oh, on bleacher yeah. seats yeah. <laughs> looking at all these teams making uh, extended chain reactions in a gymnasium. I mean, just, ex and I hope that that tradition will carry on in new ways, I must say, in the new museum. My choice of exhibition is very difficult, but since you asked, I mean, of course, I have a special fondness for the Cambridge Science Festival, not least because I always suspect that putting up the, um, Genome Trail, which must rank as one of the most difficult exhibits I ever oversaw, along uh, the street between Kendall and Harvard Square for the first year of the festival. I think it went right outside Phil Sharp's office. And he saw this curious structure on the street. And that's how we came to get the link with Phil, which has been very important to us. So I have a double reason for liking the festival, but when it comes to exhibitions, I, I think I would just get a shout for this thing we did recently called The Enemy, which happened in this space, and it was an entirely virtual reality exhibition. It was a great achievement by our exhibition team to pull it off. It was also a collaboration with the Center for Art, Science, and Technology, and the new is here. It was very, very hard to do, and very, very memorable for anybody who actually went into the exhibition. It was like, you've never done anything like this before. And to me, it was uh, a special thing. I did want to point out one factor that uh, played a critical role in building the collections and getting word out. Uh, we had uh, our first two students that we, MIT students that we hired in the museum. We had no money to pay them, of course, but that didn't stop us. Uh, so we, uh, we uh, one was Scott Ferguson, class of 78, and he uh, organized a trip, a tour of every storeroom on campus, literally every storeroom. And we worked with the, de the department administrative officer who I knew from my time in the humanities, uh, and we found Phenomenal stuff. It's just that we fill the basement of it here with that. The other one uh, of those first two students was David. Uh, sure, uh, <laughs> forgot. Huh? Dave Carp. David Carp. Yes, of course. Uh, David had a special knack for uh, repair, uh, working with Phil, and we had taken over a staggering amount of MIT film that had come from various departments and so forth. And one of the things he did was to uh, do a film, of, uh, just as an example, he did a film of, he, we had in the collection, but it had never been restored or shown, a film taken in the early 30s at the uh, mining, at the engineering camp in down East Maine. Uh, Machias, and that film uh, was shown to the class of 35, and one of the of uh, uh, the leaders of the class was watching it, and big tears were rolling down his eyes because he couldn't believe that the film from 1931 of him being in East Machias even existed. And this, I mean, that shows you how important. And uh, that's 
I guess that's why I'm an mem honorary member of a class of 35. But that's, <laughs> a, that's another matter entirely. But, I, you know. I have to tell a secret story, though, that Scott shared with us a couple of years ago when he visited. On this tour, this was when MIT, everything was keyed, and it's the pre-Schlage system, all Yale locks. And there was actually a campus master key. <laughs> Uh, and Warren, you had made arrangements for to get hold of one of these keys to facilitate this inspection of all these closets all over the place so that they didn't have to pester department chairmen and, and the like to get into these places. Scott revealed to me later is, Warren, you gave them this key and you made them swear six ways to Sunday that you, they weren't going to lose it, they weren't going to give it to anyone, that this was very precious, that, you know, how special this was. And Scott says, we just couldn't tell you, Warren, that we already had a key because we were part of the hacking group on oh, campus. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious about some of your challenges that you faced. Are there some things that you thought were going to be super easy to do and then just turn out to be nightmarishly difficult? Or uh, are there some I things that you thought would be really hard um, that you know, just seemed to, all the pieces seemed to fall into place. Arthur Ganson was invited to create a sculpture for the, one of these windows here, and he created a version of what's called Mar Margot's Other Cat. And his, most of his sculptures, if you know them, are pretty intimate, small scale. This was an experiment for him where he, it was exploded, and he had all these gears and this, stuffed, I mean, it was a, you know, stuffed cat. It was a toy cat. Um, and it was being <laughs> flung around and, you know, and the animal rights people in this People's oh. Republic of Cambridge, <laughs> People's Republic of Cambridge came forward and were outraged. Oh, that's about that. <laughs> outraged. And so what we thought would be a very effective at street level attractor to the museum <laughs> <laughs> had to be removed. <laughs> it was censored. <laughs> Do you remember that, Jane? I, I think I didn't. I remember doing, you know, we did the whole thing, but I didn't remember that. Yeah. Oh my God. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> Actually, it's hard for me to remember challenges because Mary dealt with so much that I'm not sure I was actually aware of all the things that were going on. So, yeah. My biggest challenge when I came is that I came with a fixed idea, as Debbie knows well, and some other colleagues who will know too. I was going to move this museum into the Metropolitan Warehouse, and it was going to take five years. Because if you look at the first strategic plan that we oversaw, uh, in my time, that was the lead message, you know, by the end of this plan, we'll be in the Metro Warehouse. If that had been done, we'd have been in the Metro Warehouse in 2010. And it probably is obvious to you all that we didn't do that. And the reason was that was much harder to pull off than I realized that it was impossible, in fact. <laughs> I do remember seeing that strategic plan and thinking, hmm. <laughs> you never told me. And no, I didn't, because I don't do that. <laughs> I just think, good luck. Um, but yes, I remember, because Harvey was, yeah, he yes, had yes, worked yes. so hard Harvey's to try and make that, make that happen. Yeah. And we actually pulled back from doing it. I'm quite struck that you asked two questions, if I remember. One was a challenge, something you thought would be easy and was hard. That was the one. Yeah. And the other thing, what uh, you thought would be hard turned out to be easy was actually, in a sense, getting permission to go and start the new museum in Kendall because we had given up, in my time, the idea of going into a new place. And then suddenly this opportunity sprang up. And I won't try and go into the details, but suddenly there was an opportunity you never thought was there. So that would be the flip side of the coin. I have one that, that I thought was going to be difficult and then turned easy, which was around the hacks and the collection of hacks. Yes. And, and I arrived, and I remember I got a call from someone. Actually, I don't remember the p person's name, but I think he was in material science. Anyway, the student newspaper, which of course I've now forgotten the name of, the, the MIT, the tech, 
had done an article about me arriving, and at some point I had obviously said something that led them to believe that I was going to take the police car off display. You know, oh. that. so the article, the tenor of the article was, "Who the hell does this woman think she is? <laughs> she doesn't understand MIT. You know, how could she even conceive of it?" Which, of course, I had no such conception. Anyway, so I. I, he left a message, I called him back, and we had a great conversation, and I wish I could remember who it was, because then we became friends. But um, I remember thinking, actually, inside, oh my god, how am I going to learn about this hack collection, and how are we going to look after it, and whatever. And then meeting, well, of course, Don was around, sorry to keep mentioning him, but around who sort of was calming me down about how, yes, we would be able to conserve them, because, of course, I'm looking at these things thinking, how, how are we going to conserve them? How, how are they still going to be around in 100 years? Except for the donuts, which I don't think ever need, needed conserving because they just were still exactly the same 12 years after or whatever. Anyway, the donuts <laughs> never needed to be replaced. Right. Um, they were Dunkin' Donuts. They were Dunkin' Donuts. I was <laughs> like, never buy them. Never <laughs> eat Dunkin'. Do you know, like 12 years later, they still look exactly the same? What is it that they have? But then meeting Terry and just suddenly becoming aware that there was this whole community around the hacks that were going to help me get to grips and suddenly I thought like I totally get this you know there are so many people around to help so that that was something that caused me a little inner sort of angst and then soon became clear that everyone at MIT loved the hacks and so they were going to really be helpful about doing it so that that was something that Speaking of that humor and easier. fun Warren you started something uh, the Ig Nobel Awards um, and uh, they uh, attracted quite a bit of attention. And my favorite is the year that they were sponsored by you and Kathy and others invented Kelvin, the unisex fragrance that made all wearers absolutely cool. <laughs> and uh, there were shirts and t-shirts about Kelvin and uh, the fragrance, but Tell maybe people about the Ig Nobel Awards. Many of you have heard about them at Harvard, but didn't know that they actually originated here at the museum. We were approached by a, a student to, if we'd be interested in sponsoring it. And it sounded like a great idea, so we've, we uh, reserved uh, Kresge. And uh, we did, I think, four or five years of it before it, it moved to up the street to the others school here in Cambridge. But uh, at any rate, it, it was a very unusual uh, event, to say the least. I, I will say, in theory, Kelvin was sold in the shop. And we haven't talked about the shop, but I know that the shop has been really important to all four of your um, uh, tenure here at, at the museum. And I wondered if you have some memories of getting it. How did that get started? And you know, the famous catalog, and then Jane, you had to, we had a shop, then we didn't have a shop, then we had a shop. I, I that, say, like, how did this uh, come to be? I do vaguely remember uh, there had been a previous large store that I never saw, which hadn't done so well. I recall that. It's just it's passed hard. discreetly over yeah. that by saying. Yeah. No, no, it's, but, it's but, difficult. Uh, we had, when I started, we had a tiny store, and it was a shelf, or maybe two shelves, linked to what was then the main entrance to this museum on the second floor. And it was, it was sort of under where the admissions staff person stood. And there might have been 20 yeah. different items for sale. And the amazing thing was, I still remember that that tiny store, not even really a store, just a, sh a couple of shelves, apparently was turning over I think the figure in my head is $60,000 a year. So I mean, that's not much for a store. But on the other hand, that's not much by way of a store. So it's like, well, there could be something here, you know? And so that's why when we opened this floor, which was in 2007, we decided to take a gamble and bring the store down to the ground floor where it absolutely thrived. Well, it um, had a street presence, which it yeah. never had before. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things about the catalog, though, is that occurs at precisely the mo moment that the world is going digital. And I'm looking at David <laughs> Nunez here and thinking a little bit, maybe to ask you a little bit about our digital museum. I, I realized, who started, who had the first website? And 
you know, when did we, Mary, you were part of getting the very first experiments with getting collections online. And Jane, you got us digitizing oh, no, holography. Swallow Richards database. Right. That, yes, but, I remember but that. Actually, we did. Um, Kara Schneiderman, who was our registrar and collections manager, who's now the director of collections at Jane's Museum, started the museum website in the mid 1990s when almost nobody had a website. And she did a fabulous job with it. And then um, really focused on the Edgerton collection, which we had funding to digitize and make available online. So that's kind of, I would say, the nucleus or the starter collection for our um, digital collections. I'm um, interested in uh, a question about people and audience here for the museum. And each of you, you've spoken about alumni, and we've talked about people in the public. But who do you think of when you first came here? What was the target audience? And how then have you viewed it as, you know, what have been the opportunities to expand that audience over time? I think there's a duality. The MIT community is a very important audience. But then we, as a museum, um, we want to serve the greater community, too. So I think there's that figuring out that mission and how to serve the MIT community, and then at the same time, the general public. I'll just say that as a starter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, it, it felt like it was, it was sort of everybody, which is the same as saying nobody. Uh, but yeah, I definitely, when I came in, felt there was that um, MIT community without question the Cambridge community, and then sort of people who were coming to find out about MIT. You know, I mean, MIT has this sort of incredible reputation across the world, and so there would be this sense in which you, you, the museum was the place to sort of present MIT in all its, you know, all the facets. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would say that's how I sort of divided it in my head, really. Um, um, I don't know if that's changed a lot. I don't know. What, I think it is true, just reflecting on my time, that when I came, I think I wanted us to give a real emphasis to audiences outside MIT. And the way I used to put it, so I must have believed this because I can remember this little spiel. <laughs> and the spiel was, you know, MIT folks, we really want you on the stage uh, more than we want you in the audience. And uh, to me, that's always been the case, you know, that the MIT uh, faculty and students are the single most appealing exhibits that the MIT Museum will ever have, you know. And, and the colleagues have heard me say this before. If we, if we have an MIT research student playing with something on the, sh on the exhibition floor, it will be the star attraction, whatever they're doing. When we open this ground floor, Gary will remember, we had a, an experimental wheel assembly that, that had been made as part of the city car project by folks in the media lab. And of course, it was an, it was an experimental car. So guess what? The working wheel assembly worked for about 12 hours. And then it stopped. And of course, it was a research student project. So after a time, and whenever they felt like it, some students turned up. They didn't sort of think about whether there was any audience. They just came, a bunch of people in uh, jeans and t-shirts and laptops. And they started over there fiddling with this thing to try and make it work. And before long, the entire, because this was the museum was open, the entire audience on the ground floor had deserted all the other exhibits. And they were all crowded around, these research students, who were just simply playing with a laptop and doing something, who knows. It's always been that way in my experience. So I've always felt that our greatest asset is the MIT community, but we want them to get them in front of audiences who don't get a chance to meet them every day. So that was what I was trying to do, to swivel our attention as far as visitors is concern, are concerned, but to do it with the whole of MIT behind us. I'm thinking as we come to the end of this panel that I 
was remembering my first day of work. And Jane, you called me into your office and uh, to dis discuss your plans for me. And they included a pair of exhibitions. Uh, one of them was the aforementioned robotics and AI exhibit. Another was uh, an exhibit. Um, and, and you said to me at the time, I always remember this, uh, robots are to science museums what dinosaurs are to natural history museums. We must do an exhibit, and we come by it honestly here. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but then you said, nobody really knows what the MIT Museum has to offer in terms of exhibitions and programs. But to the extent they expect anything or have any conception, it's that this will be a place that they can learn something about MIT, uh, its history, its achievements, its challenges, uh, and why MIT matters. And I thought that might be a great question to pose to you a little bit about um, why you think MIT still needs a museum. And we're about to, we're at a real inflection point in our history. We're going to move into uh, extraordinarily uh, a, a new facility. Um, we have an amazing new team of people here on board uh, to make that transition. And I'm really wondering if you might share with us some of your uh, thoughts about the museum, what makes it distinctive, why it's valuable, what, um, and what you hope maybe for the future. I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you think, John. I, I mean, to me, it seems so exciting to be a real gateway. I mean, I think we've always seen the museum as a gateway into MIT, but now it's sort of physically literal as well as sort of, you know, in terms of yeah. Um, yeah. what we're doing. So. I don't know. I, I'm tempted to say, honestly, that if MIT didn't have the museum, it would have to reinvent it. And so I see it more, not more, but I see it partly in terms of what the Institute actually needs. So MIT is, as we all know, it's a place devoted to knowledge in pursuit of public service and in pursuit of the public good. If you look at the mission statement for MIT, that's what it's about. And I think we know enough to know that however smart a group of people is, they can't do that successfully if they're doing it in a closed room on their own. They're not going to be able to get the changes they want and make the world a better place. You need to engage the wider community in that. I just think MIT's work is so important that it's very important that, that a wider community be engaged in what the Institute is doing. And of course, we're not the only people at MIT who do that. But I do think this is a focus in the Institute for that kind of engagement. And that's, I think, why it's so important. And I just think it's where we are in the 21st century. We know there's a lot of questioning of expertise. There's a lot of questioning of science in recent years in ways that some of us might never have imagined. And if we're going to address those issues, we've got to be out there. And what better place to be out there from than MIT? Well, I hope. Um you all might join me in thanking our panelists for sharing some of their memories and thoughts. Um, we're going to have an opportunity to share stories with each other. In a few moments, our caterers are going to bring in uh, treats for all of us. But um, thank you, Warren, Mary, John, and um, Jane. I just fired up. This woman had the best application letter. I've hired many people. <laughs> it, it started, dear, I don't know, whoever, search committee. Um, as I sit in my house that is about two and a half million, she had the exact number, smoots from the MIT Museum. That was the first <laughs> sentence. And I was like, OK, I think this is who we need. You know, but anyway. <laughs> So yes, I'm the woman that hired you. My name is Jane. <laughs> well, I got out of order. But anyway, I want to thank you all both for today, but also for 50 years of amazing service to this museum.